uh, I'll just briefly start this off. Probably the, the most important topic, uh, quite frankly, over the last year has been the COVID-19 and the ensuing pandemic, and, and again, some of the economic crises that, that arose nationally from that. Uh, the number one priority for Chesterfield County right now is the, the vaccination efforts uh, and ensuring that our people, our most vulnerable people, most eligible people, are getting their allotment of doses. So what you're going to have today is a comprehensive uh, presentation uh, between state and local leaders in Chesterfield County in, in relation to this topic. Uh, I'll first introduce Dr. Worsley, and then you'll have Dr. Samuel, and then Chief Center will all be, again, here to present what they know to be the facts. They, they know to be what they, uh, is within their parameters to act upon. Uh, there's questions that are welcomed by you uh, with, again, honest answers to be had. And if they're not here today, uh, we will try and get them to you and to the public who, who may be watching uh, soon after. They deserve to, to know what is going on and, and what we can do and what we can't do. And then I'll follow up on the end, you know, just again, our, our continued efforts of how we can be a supportive role uh, in a state system, uh, not just knock on the door, open the door, not just walk into the room, but sit at the table uh, side by side really f until this is over, and, and, and not just be acting in the past tense, uh, not just acting in, in, a, in a tense that people don't want us to act in. So there, there is some state hierarchical issues involved, but I, I can honestly say I believe that uh, Dr. Samuel and, and the good staff that I met over at the fairgrounds today, uh, you know, their emergency coordinator and lead nurse, and I believe the emergency coordinator is in the audience here at least, they are good-hearted people trying to do a good thing. And so, but we are on the same team, and as was referenced today at the fairground site, uh, it is two units on one mission, where it's one mission with two units, and people don't care whether it's one, two, three, or four, it is one singular mission, and we are going to be laser focused, and we're going to be accountable going forward, as we have been in the past. So without further ado, I'll introduce Dr. Worsley. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Casey. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Dr. Casey, we appreciate those comments. First, I would like to thank the board and the staff for the two important products uh, that were produced this week regarding the lack of vaccines for Chesterfield citizens. Uh, first, Mr. W Mr. Holland and Mr. Winslow authored an article in the RTD that ran this past Sunday titled, State Continues to Shun Local Government Help. And secondly, the Board of Supervisors sent a letter to the Honorable Ralph Northam, Governor of Virginia, to employ him and the Virginia Department of Health to consider further how localities such as Chesterfield County may assist in the state's vaccination rollout. Today, as Dr. Casey mentioned, we will have an update from Dr. Alexander Samuel, Chesterfield Health District Director, and his staff to address the many concerns of the board and citizens of Chesterfield County. Uh, there has been a plethora of shortcomings and disappointments throughout the vaccination rollout. We all know that. Uh, followed by Dr. Sam's presentation will be a local update, as mentioned, uh, from Chief Center and his staff. But rest assured that the leadership of Chesterfield County stand ready to carry the banner forward regarding the operations of vaccination rollout. Good afternoon and welcome, Dr. Samuel. We ask that you will please introduce your staff uh, and their roles as well. Thank you, Dr. Worsley, Dr. Casey, uh, Mr. Holland, members of the board. Um, I, I am privileged to come here with members of my staff and uh, would like to introduce them at the moment. Vicki Stamps, who is our nurse manager. And under regular times, uh, well, at, right now during the COVID operations, she is serving as our operation chief. Nurse manager under regular circumstances. Uh, Janelle Ampey, uh, Chesterfield Health District health educator, who is serving as our communications lead and David Woods, uh, who is our emergency planner. So um, in, in the time I have, I want to address a few thematic areas that I believe encompass the core components of the coronavirus vaccine rollout. You know, and at the outset, I certainly, certainly want to acknowledge that um, things have not worked out to the, 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 uh, the degree and the extent that we had hoped. Um, so next slide, please. So first, talk a little bit about vaccine distribution basics. Um, vaccines are developed, of course, by companies, and uh, transport is mediated right now by Operation Warp Speed, initiated by the federal government, uh, with logistical assistance, ultimately, to states. Uh, in Virginia, the Virginia Department of Health is currently responsible for allocating a very limited supply of vaccine to localities. 
who then, of course, manage vaccine administration. So who distributes at the locality level? Uh, for the initial phase of vaccine rollout, which was aimed at healthcare personnel, the, the 1A group, which I think we're all familiar with, the primary recipients were hospital systems and health districts. The original, original plan was predicated on healthcare systems managing the heavy lift of vaccinating 1A individuals, with health departments serving in a support role. <clears throat> There's been variable response by health systems across the state. Uh, in the central region, which includes the Metro Richmond area, health departments have had to assume the primary role of vaccinating healthcare personnel not affiliated with healthcare systems. Um, in addition, there is a growing list of pharmacy partners and providers to whom we can distribute vaccine to dispense. Uh, we are tapping that resource heavily while supplies are, are growing. So how do we determine who gets vaccine? Expecting the vaccine supplies would be low in the early stages of rollout. Uh, the Advisory Commission Committee on Immunization Practices, which is a, a federal entity, established priority groups based on risk of adverse events from contracting COVID or the risk of critical infrastructure loss in the event of widespread employee exposure to illness or illness. So the broader 1A, 1B, and 1C groups were established and the Virginia Department of Health further defined who would be individual by each of those subcategories. Finally, ensuring a consistent vaccine supply has been a significant challenge and hasn't kept up with the accelerated pace with which we've been tasked with to move through the phases. Health districts were directed to enter phase 1B uh, literally one, one week ago on January 18th, uh, which includes roughly now half the state's population. So a very broad um, uh, category to, to, to uh, cover. Uh, consequently, uh, uh, cons uh, alongside all of that, uh, vaccine supply uh, collapsed uh, more or less at the same time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so with respect to the current plan, um, and, and this has to do with dealing with a very, very now limited supply of doses that are coming to the states from the federal government. So as of this past week, uh, the state is expected to receive about 100,000, a little bit more than 100,000 doses of vaccine per week. Uh, the new plan instituted last week was for health districts to control the distribution of vaccine, which, be, which will be allotted to health districts on a per capita basis. So this health district will receive 4,625 total doses each week. Um, I was informed day before yesterday that our next allocation will be reduced by 100 doses. So we're expecting 4,525 doses total this coming week. So the basic rationale is that health districts would have a pretty good idea about how to allocate this very limited supply based on need. Uh, the current estimates are that we could be about six to eight weeks away from improved supply. I mean, those are estimates only at this point. So dose allocation totals have been offered, that 4,525 uh, dose allotment uh, per week to give us a four-week planning time frame. So um, below you'll see the breakdown of uh, how this week's allocation will be distributed by population group here in, in this health district. So we settled on these three groups either because of vulnerability to adverse outcomes or again, the critical nature of the work they perform. So it includes more direct allocation to seniors uh, uh, than, than we had been uh, as we then jumped into 1B, which will certainly of course be expanded, uh, a portion to essential workers and an amount we believe will cover most of our remaining 1A population. 1A again is the healthcare personnel. Um, below that, you will see a, another list which further defines the essential worker and senior population categories who we're aiming our vaccination efforts at this week. Uh, individuals over the age of 75 have the highest risk for COVID-19 associated morbidity and mortality uh, and individuals 65 years old and older uh, with an underlying health condition have a higher risk of morbidity, mor morbidity and mortality risk as well. Next slide, please. All right. Um, I had uh, 
gotten a few pictures uh, that I hope to share of our current uh, vaccine pods. Uh, I got those pictures to, to you all a little bit too late. Um, but there is currently a pod, I'm, I'm sure you know, you ob obviously know, in operation at the, at the fairgrounds. Um, we have held several 250-person pointed dispensing events over the past two weeks. Yesterday, we held our first uh, large pod with a target of vaccinating 750 people. Uh, the pod was primarily aimed at 1A and 1B individuals that I just mentioned. So with regard to challenges and improvements, um, certainly there, there is room for improvement, um, uh, much of which you know, is uh, a function of, of uh, jumping into this in, in relatively short order. So I mentioned yesterday's pod events because it demonstrated some of the challenges uh, we've uh, had as we've attempted to keep pace with the rapidly advancing and rapidly evolving statewide vaccination distribution program and operation. Um, this system for managing vaccine registration has been undergoing transition. The first system that was in place uh, was a, a product from the CDC known as uh, the acronym VAMS, V-A-M-S, stands for the Vaccine Management System, um, made it functionally very difficult to uh, directly uh, direct re registrants to specific pods. Pod stands for point of dispensing. Um, once a pod is created in the system, it becomes open to anyone who is seeking an appointment, which can limit access to target groups. So in effect, if you create one of these pods, put it out there, uh, an individual can register for any pod that is out there. Hence, you will find folks from across the state uh, trying to access a pod that you have specifically set up for, for individuals in your, hopefully, health district or, or catchment area. Uh, so VDH is transitioning away from van, VAMS uh, towards a new system called PrEP Mod, uh, which we'll be instituting next week. So our workaround registration system has some deficiency that we're highlighted in the pod yesterday. Even though we work to provide appointments or time frames for people who we had registered, many more people than the 750 we were expecting arrived at the site. We've since worked hard to rectify the process errors. However, it should be noted that much of what happened transpired because we were diverting a limited supply of workers into multiple directions. The lists of tasks that we have to address is growing uh, literally every day, uh, much of which is a function of having been thrown into this very quickly and earlier than we had expected. Um, so you're well aware also of the challenges that we've had with our call center and website. Uh, none of this is uh, unique to this particular health district. Um, every health district right now is overwhelmed with calls, though some with more resources uh, could allocate uh, 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 benefit towards at least uh, developing their web uh, functionality and we're able to create online pre-registration forms to place people on waiting lists. Uh, we have since done that uh, since this past Monday. Um, I have heard from, from many uh, individuals, uh, uh, both constituents of yours as well as yourselves, uh, about the, the inconveniences that has, this has caused, uh, for which um, I offer my sincere apologies uh, for, for that circumstance. Uh, we're working hard to upstaff and improve our call center capacity and have recently worked with County, County ISD to overcome a, a phone system glitch uh, that resulted in, in incredibly long uh, hold times. Uh, on Monday, uh, again, we added that online registration tool for individuals in the 1B category to pre-register and get placed on the waiting list, um, and uh, then ultimately get a call back for an appointment. Now, given the number of individuals who are being placed on that waiting list and the very, very limited supply that we have, uh, callback and registration being put in one of our pods for, for a vaccination could take considerable amounts of time, several weeks to, to even longer at this point, with supply being what it is. Uh, my final point there has to do with data management, and this, of course, is uh, probably one of the biggest challenges now with the types of data, the amount, the complexity, trying to integrate it, uh, not just a problem here internally, but statewide. Um, we trust that with many people working on this, with the systems in place to try and improve it, that will gain um, uh, accuracy as, as well as uh, efficiency in being able to make it publicly available. 
so with that, I'll, I'll close my comments. Uh, I know you have many questions, and, and uh, I'm happy to be available to address them. Thank you, Dr. Samuel. Questions and comments, uh, board members? This has been an interesting well, process. Well, well, I'll just jump right in here. Please. So let's just start with where we are right now. The citizen says to me, what do I do? I, I fit in that category. I qualify. What do I do? So I, I have to say I'm perplexed because um, we went from, you know, t to direct them to call in, we know is just like there's just this, even in spite of the fact that we're trying to update and improve the call center capacity, um, you know, folks sitting on, on a phone line, you know, seems to not be the most efficient way for anything to work. Um, and then all they're going to do is get themselves into a queue that at some point they might get called back. Then we have a online tool that is operational now, but that also just puts them in a queue. And then, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that what you're telling me or telling us is that the VDH is transitioning to a different online method that will start next week. Is that correct? A different registration system that we will be implementing next week. Yes, a few other districts have started. So, so if they call in, if they add the, if they go to the current online tool, I mean, what, you know, if this was somebody calling you, what do you tell them to do? Yes. What do? We, how do we direct these folks? Yeah, that's an excellent question, Ms. Haley. Um, I'm afraid the the answer that I have is not one that is, I would say. Uh, entirely satisfactory. So the, the process right now is as you described it, an individual attempts to call in. Um, we trust that we are gaining more capacity to be able to take those calls and, and then gets basically pre-registered, put on a waiting list. Uh, the other option is through an on online modality for the same, same means. Um, the way that the systems work then for registration is we will have a I think greater efficiency in being able to move people off of that waiting list into the registration system, which then automates the function of being able to direct them to a pod for, for vaccination delivery. So I'm, I'm still, I guess, in this, if, they, if they're registered on this online tool that exists right now, there's no guarantee that that's going to get transitioned over to the tool that VDH, uh, that we're going to start using with VDH that starts next week, correct? Um, so again, my, my understanding of at least how the, the prep mod system works, it's more kind of behind the scenes. Um, there is not yet a good functional online registration system in place that a, a, uh, a, a user can access directly through the web. So. Uh, across the state, it's, it's pretty much the same uh, situation as I've described. Uh, a, an individual gets on a waiting list, and then if there is a, an operating registration system, they're transitioned from that waiting system by staff onto the, the state portal. So recognizing that we are servicing Chesterfield citizens and Chesterfield Chesterfield citizens, county employees, our health, you know, our, our uh, CCPS employees and folks, is there a reason that we couldn't use a IT tool designed and implemented by our IT folks, which if they're in the room, they might shoot me. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but knowing, the, knowing the incredible, um, right, the, knowing the incredible systems that we've developed here, is there a reason we could not use? Because it just seems to me like the manpower involved in this and the inefficiencies involved in this, you know, this is, in, in, I hate to compare us, but I listened to Governor Justice from West Virginia this morning who said, you know what, the question posed to him was how did you do it? And he said we brought the National Guard in because this was a deployment. It wasn't a medical question. It was we had the medical staff administering, but it was a deployment and they know how to deploy. And I'm, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, you know, our IT folks know how to develop a model that takes away all these aspects of all of these inconsistencies. Is there a reason we we in Chesterfield couldn't serve our citizens with an IT model that takes all of this 
inaccuracies out and all of the just the incredible amount of people work and calling back and missing people and yeah no, I mean that is an excellent question I, I mean I, I I can't really speak to sort of the state mandated managed administrative detail that would have to be or is already kind of existent in in the in the processes of, of, of handling data and and all of that I mean I think that would be um, one of those things that would need to be addressed. So, so that, um, my understanding then is that that would have to be co a coordinated effort. You, you don't have the ability to just that turn that over to us. And so, so I guess from our perspective, and I, I don't want to speak on behalf of everybody, but I can tell you, like we're at the table, we're here. <laughs> like mm -hmm. tell, you, tell us what you need from us. Yeah, exactly. Right. Mr. Chair. Yeah. So, you know, if you, I know that there's legislation that's being fast tracked through the General Assembly right now, both in the House and Senate. Ship Senator Donovan has a Senate bill, I think it's 1495, that's already passed through the Senate, it's been sent over to the House. And if that legislation goes through, it's going to allow for the state to allow for localities to work like this. Um, I'm hoping it's going to go through. I don't think there's any reason to believe that it's not. So, why not? whether start working ahead of time, be prepared to flip the switch so when the legislation gets passed, all we have to do is go, Beep, we're ready to do it. That's my suggestion. Thank you. Ms. Dingle. Yes. So with PrepMed, what is that going to do differently than the current system? Yeah, so uh, with, with reference to the, I guess, transitioning away from VAMS, um, the, the big challenge, again, as I mentioned, was the control over where people could ultimately end up. Uh, Prep mod does give more control. So uh, we could designate the fairgrounds as a place that we want to send uh, 300 people to, and just those 300 people, uh, whereas previously we could not. You would have 1,000 people uh, from across the state registering. You. And if they sign up on Prep Med next week, will they be, if we had a certain number of vaccinations, uh, the vaccines they can get uh, 300 people would it take the first 300 people that meet the criteria and give them an appointment and put a backlog in for the next group of people or is it just a list that compiles a list of people to call to try to get somebody to come in yes sir as I understand it and I, and I, I can't claim to know that system very well it's just now coming coming out we are we are getting trained in it um, my, my understanding, again, it's a registration support tool that we would do the screening physically and then input the individuals who fit those criteria, who that system then um, basically helps schedule and direct. And is that screening all done over the phone? Uh, we collect the data over the phone, yes. And then so to Ms. Haley's point, it just seems like there's got to be a tool where people can load this information. Now, we need a phone system so that those that aren't um, technologically, uh, that are technologically challenged still have a way to get into the system. But it seems that there could be a lot more efficiency. And I understand you stand before us and you don't have uh, necessarily the authority to allow us to move forward without the state giving you that authority. And neither do we without the state giving us that authority. But um, I heard uh, one mission, two units, and this really isn't one mission, two units. This is one mission, one unit, and we need to unify and collaborate together to make this happen. And the state, if you can pass that on, because we will help you. We're not bashful. We've already sent the message, and we will continue to send the message. Um, but this is one team. And we need to work together, and I think that we're probably going to start trying to put the tool together on the county side with the belief that the state is going to make some good decisions and allow you to free it up for us to work as one team so that we can solve this together. Um, Mr. Engler, if I could just clarify one thing, because it's, I think, very relevant to what you said. This, this new module of, of prep uh, mode, I think it's what it's called, actually, while people may be able to start registering for it, the backlog that they have of, of emails and phone calls, this online survey, all of those people that have also registered, 
they are in some systems, multiple systems, and, and they are really, in essence, should be the next first in line. Uh, so that those that even when we do open up this new, new portal, it may be weeks, many weeks, if, if again, if, if, just using simple math, if he has uh, 15,000 people are already accumulated in all these other manners, and we only get 3,000 doses per week for them, he's five weeks away possibly from the first prep mode person from, from getting their appointment. But I, just, I think that's want to clarify that we need them to start getting in line, and they need to have the reasonable knowledge and expectations for the 3,000 doses per week that almost some message should go back that you should, you should be hearing from us in, in X time period. And just to set those expectations, we've heard government entities throughout the country with days and weeks, but we're not talking about weeks. We're talking about months. Isn't that correct? Well, to cover the whole 1B population, sure. given the doses that we have, I, I think that is a very fair assessment. I, I just think that one of the reasons why we're having so much feedback is that w expectations have been set much greater than can actually be obtained. And that if we can just be honest with each other, and this is where we're really at, this is what we're really facing, and these are the numbers of people that we need to take care of, that that clarity will help some people to understand. Because there's citizens that believe that uh, there's plenty of vaccine out there, and they're just not able to get it here, but they can get it somewhere else. And that's not really what's going on in the state. But it is the perception of our citizens, and we need to, to change the perceptions and the expectations of our citizens to something that's more real. And that's not something that we want to do and something that we want to share, but it is what they need to know so that we can all work together moving forward. Um, and the, the last thing I wanted to just make sure everybody understands is a lot of people here, uh, Chestfield Health Department, and they associate that with Chesterfield County government. And although I do believe we're on one team and we have to work together, our team is even bigger than just the county because it's Powhatan and Colonial Heights as well. It's all part of this team because we're all part of the same health district. And um, I'm not sure that everybody, when they hear Chesterfield Health Department, they associate it with Chesterfield government, not the state government that operates in Chesterfield County. Um, and again, I don't want to make it a us and you. I want to make it how do we work together collaboratively on the local team. But we do need to just make sure that people understand the differences, because I don't think that that's been well defined for most of our citizens as well. So. Right. I think you're correct there. I know you uh, probably are losing um, three times as much sleep as the rest of us are, and we are hearing it. So I, I greatly respect what you're going through. I know there's been some misinformation about uh, you in particular um, not getting some doses loaded into the computer wrong, which was not correct. And um, we, we want to stand up for you and say we know you're working as hard as you can. But we also want you to know that when we go around you, we're trying to help you not go through you. Um, that, Mr. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I want to I say uh, I completely agree with uh, my colleague's uh, assessment. And, um, you know, this was not a system designed for one a person, the governor, or to have control over everything, and we have so many resources, and it just it just seems like the um, uh, the person who is is maybe uh, thinking about all of this has not uh, tapped into all of the resources that are available, and we do want to be a partner with you. Uh, on that, and I did have some questions about uh, this this registration process because Miss Haley's questions prompted some of my own. What type of data are we collecting on the phone? Sure, I might ask some of my team members to assist with that, but certainly we're collecting uh, ways to identify an individual when they actually appear at one of our sites, which is obviously critical, um, and then information relevant to underlying health conditions if they have them. So. Um, Name, date of birth, underlying health conditions, anything else, team? Phone number. Phone number. Email address so that we can mail it. Email address. 
Do we collect physical address? We do not. So, does, so we have, it's uh, five, five categories about, of information. Exactly. Yeah. And is it possible that while, so I understand that there's been some data collected from uh, previous efforts, and so we've got some folks on this waiting list, if you will, yes. right now. Um, would it be possible to have uh, volunteers or other workers or resources devoted to helping you all shift that data over? I know that that's got to be consuming uh, process uh, for you to move from one, data from one system to another, uh, particularly when you know you've got the data already and all you're doing is migrating it. Just seems like something that you know we may be able to again uh, assist with uh, from a resource standpoint. So really, what I want to do is ask you about these opportunities to to assist uh, to assist your your efforts uh, in that regard. Yeah, and I think we are trying to work on systems as well internally, obviously, to make that um, easily, more easily accessible and actionable on our end. Um, that certainly has been one of those challenges with everything else that has been going on to, to, to get that process uh, you know, streamlined and, and moving forward. Um, yeah, I, I would... I don't know if any of my team members could speak to any of the potential issues with regard to managing data and sharing that data. I know we obviously do our very best to protect individual confidentiality. David Woods, our emergency planner, is coming up. Dr. Casey, Mr. Holland, members of the uh, uh, Board of Supervisors, thank you for uh, letting us come today and share uh, our thoughts about this process. As we all are very well aware, this is a uh, debacle around the world, and uh, we're having our own little share of it. Um, in terms of the actual registration process, that seems to be a great uh, deal of the source of your questions and your constituents' frustrations. Believe me, I get that. And so, as you had asked Mr. Winslow about the process, uh, as it currently stands, Ms. Haley, is that there was the call center, then there was the email address, and now we have the online survey tool. And as uh, Dr. Casey and I were talking this morning over at the fairgrounds, uh, I was sharing with him that we are smooshing those lists together and taking a consolidated list and operating from. And because it's now in a software platform where those uh, lists are manageable, we can extract the email addresses, we can extract phone numbers in a much more uh, easy way. Instead of your folks calling into a call center and being put on hold or, or even having their name taken down with the pledge that we'll get back to you, which I assure you, I personally assure you, that is our endeavor to do every single call just as we have uh, you know, said we would. Now we have a better system in place to actually reach out to them en masse and begin to give them the answers they're seeking. Unfortunately, as Dr. Samuel has said, that answer is not going to be satisfactory because despite the best systems, the, the best plans we have, until that vaccine pipeline opens up, it will possibly be months until we get through the list of those who desire to have a needle stuck in their arm. And uh, that's hopefully everyone, so that we can end this madness. Now, the system that's coming online, Prep Mod, is the one that is being used to set up clinics. And Dr. Casey, your wife, I believe, had the opportunity to use VAMS, the Vaccine Administrative Management System. That I just got to interject. My wife is a Henrico private school teacher um, and, and registered uh, through her employer, so I just didn't want to. I, I apologize. I'm just simply saying in terms of using this, the registration system, not receiving a vaccine, I don't have any idea, actually. The registration system, though, VAMS, was for the purpose of getting folks who were eligible to receive vaccinations into a pod, into a particular point of dispensing. And that would be set up by uh, a local health district so that folks could then find it in their proximity and register. We did VAMS for the Powhatan Fire and EMS 
group and we had 35 slots to give very limited vaccine at first so that their first responders could get the vaccine first. We had over 200 other folks register for the Powhatan pod that had nothing to do with either the county of Powhatan or even a, uh, a health care role. We were registering people or, or seeing people register from Fort Pickett, mm -hmm. etc. And we had to go in and manually cancel appointments one by one by one so we could get it back to those 35 people. It was a nightmare. We had the second incident with our own local health district getting our nurse staff vaccinated where folks were just walking in off the street saying, I found you on VAMS. We had to twilight VAMS, sunset it, just get it off the table. And so with our discovery of this backdoor loophole, the state responded by saying, we'll go to a different system, prep mod. Prep mod is set up the same way. We will set up a clinic, and then we will send out to our targeted recipients, go into this prep mod system, create an account, register for our pod, which is now bracketed to keep other people out. Just as we found out yesterday on Courthouse Road, there's still a pot potential for error. If someone gives away that link, to their friends, neighbors, or uh, relatives, then they can get into that prep mod pod as well. But it's at least not open to the world to see. Someone has to divulge information to them. So what we would do is say for the uh, Chesterfield County Public Schools, if we were you know setting up a pod for them, we would send it to your leadership in the schools, and they would send out that link to their staff. The staff would then register in prep mod and then that automatic appointment would be in there. There's no callbacks necessary. There's no further contact other than showing up with your prep mod appointment. Now, the, the data that we have, that's where you're interested in. As of yesterday, as of last night, that brand new system that stood up on Monday about 11 o'clock, as of last night, had 22,000 names. So you see how many of our folks, how many of your folks want vaccinated. So as we smush those systems together, we can extract those emails. And then when we set up a prep mod pod for, again, CCPS, we send that to the uh, schools and say, these are the emails that we have for you. You can go ahead and let them register. So you, you're doing a data sort by email then to try to go to the organization as opposed to going to the individual to let them know they're registered at a certain location. Is that right? It can be in that context. It would probably be easier just to send it to the, uh, the uh, director of, or the principal, whoever's setting up that pod. But we have that sortability mm -hmm. for the individuals when we're targeting 75 plus or 65 with health care concerns or, or whatever. It, that's the beauty of the, that data sort. So as, uh, as this comes online, this um, prep mod system, is, does that, is that going to interface with a, a registration page? Yes, sir. Public facing that will just populate well, in no, the system? No, it, it won't be a public facing thing. As I said, as Dr. Samuel said, it's behind the scenes. We have to tell you there's a prep mod clinic for you. Use this link. So in terms of the, uh, the, the targeted populations right now, vulnerable populations, uh, 1B, you know, critical infrastructure, those are targeted. We can identify entities and, and sort that out to send it to leadership. If it goes to the standpoint of just targeting, say, 75-year-olds, we can extract 375-year-olds from the top of the list and send them an individual email or a mass email that goes to all of them, saying, here's the prep mod link, go in, set up your account, and you'll have an appointment. So this, is, this new system is not designed to be public facing at all, is what I'm hearing you say. It, to the best of my knowledge, sir, yeah. And, and it was vans, really. So I'm just looking forward. I'm looking, trying to look ahead a couple of months, try to be proactive. If that's the case, is there at some point a public facing registration process for I'm everybody else on the way or? Anyway. I'm afraid I, I can't answer that, and, and I, I would be, you know, just conjecturing. No, and I don't want you to do that, and I, and I don't, um, 
but but I mean, this has been a very interesting and enlightening uh, discussion. Uh, uh, you know, I, I certainly think that there's a level of coordination and logistics uh, that that's necessary to complete this task statewide, and I'm I'm concerned to be uh, just to be honest with you um, that we're just not um, perhaps uh, using all the resources uh, at our disposal uh, to to get uh, get this over the line. Um, but, but again, I want to reiterate my colleagues' commitment here, and I feel the exact same way. We, we're like, you know, put us in coach. We're ready to play uh, however we can do that. And so we want to we wanna assist you as much as we can, and that includes, I think, honestly, honestly, there does need to be some effort with, with this data piece, some real effort here. Thank you, sir. But the uh, overall, my commendations to uh, mm -hmm. Sheriff Leonard, Chief mm -hmm. Katz, the law enforcement support of things has been outstanding. Okay. Uh, Dr. Worsley has provided uh, you know, counsel, advice, and offered resources as well. The emergency management side from Chief Center and his team, just ex you know, extraordinary support that we've received. And it, we're all kind of in this befuddled situation, trying to make headway in an ever dynamic situation so your partnership is certainly uh, very much appreciated and uh, accepted we'll figure this out and we'll get through this together thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. just also to help clarify to, to facilitate I know you were giving an example of the pods with the schools and I think there are other practices other localities that may be doing that but I think you know with our arrangement with our school system the 1250 shots per week at least that's coming to them mm -hmm. they have their own internal in essence distribution network is my understanding amongst their school nurse program so they don't they may not necessarily have to yes. go through this prep mod that you just heard nor would our employee medical center health departments across the state where you don't have the school resources or the internal local resources to deploy their own pods for lack of a better word uh, lack of uh, you know an, an appointment system then, then you know, they're, they're using the health district for that purpose. So Powhatan and Colonial Heights, those stories may be more prevalent there for what you're doing for setting up pods for their local government and county and, and, and school employees. We don't have that on our side because we are staffed up to do that on both of our sides. I just yes, wanted sir. to clarify that for somebody yes. watching. Thank, thank you. Uh, Ms. Carroll. Um, something to consider. You know, we have um, large facilities throughout the county such as uh, we've already been contacted by Virginia State University who have offered up their campus to help uh, as a location to do these uh, vaccinations. Um, because I think what's going to happen in the future is uh, eventually the supply is going to come. And if we don't have a system in place to better deploy the supply when it does get here, then it's going to look even worse. And so that, like, that's why we want to help to be prepared so that, you know, we had the same problem when we couldn't get test kits for people to be tested, right? We had to wait for the test kits to come in. It was very limited. It took time to get them in. Well, now we have test kits. And I imagine in the future that the supply is going to come for this, and we just need to be ready with a supply chain to meet the, to meet the needs so that people are not going, why are we not getting a shot when you have all the supply in the world? And so we want to help. We have people from the community that want to help. I imagine if we needed medical expert help from nurses and, and, uh, and such, that they would come out of the woodwork to try and help yeah. to make this work. And so yeah. um, I'm hoping that the legislation will pass, which will give you a tool to let us help. Yeah, that leads to my question, uh, Madam, uh, Ms. Well, Let, I, Ms. Haley. I had kind of a follow-up. Um, Please do. Well, number one, I, I think that I think that is we, we need to have a continued conversation on how we can be at the table and help. I, this transition of all of this information is very, um, it's very unclear to me how that's gonna happen in a timely fashion. And I think that one of the issues that we need to recognize is that we have very qualified people in the community who understand and are already bound by confidentiality, whether it be some of our folks, for instance, in um, deployment situations already like National Guard and things or Red Cross people that would volunteer and just return phone calls and capture data. So I think we need to be mindful of those conversations and how we can in engage those folks because we don't really want our first, you know, our, our nurses that can be front and center actually providing, you know, vaccines and things having to also get tied up with all of this you know, this transition of paperwork and contact. So please, you know, think outside the boxes that as well. 
But the next question that's going to come and is the probably fear factor that exists right behind this level is how, do, how are they ensured that second shot is going to be administered? With the limited supply that we're hearing about, you know, can you help explain sure. for us and so our citizens here, what is the protocol and the um, ability of, and availability to ensure that their second shot is going to be timely delivered as well? Right. So the state is uh, guaranteeing second shots for doses that have been delivered to be first shots. So we, we are very much expecting and planning around being able to, to uh, provide second doses for individuals who are receiving their first doses. So I'm going to play devil's advocate here because, um, because I will just say from our citizens' perspective right now, there's just not a lot of uh, credibility in anything the state is saying. So. How do they hear that, in fact, is someone ensuring a date when they get their first shot, that they come back for a second shot? Do they have to re-register through a system that they feel is failing them? You know, how, how is this really going to be trans... How are they going to know this? The information is transmitted to them. They, they know that they're in a database. I mean, I have heard, and I think we've all heard, yes. that the state supposedly is allocating the vaccines, but the question is that, again, that information connectivity to the citizen, do they re-register? How does that work? Right. I'll let David speak to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a, a great question and one, again, that I'm very concerned about, uh, that we do honor that commitment to the uh, folks that have come out. Uh, frankly, there was a lot of concern with this vaccine. A lot of people were tentative, reluctant to get it, and those that braved the the shot and got it first right away, um, we owe them at least that bravery, that second shot that guarantees or, or gives that uh, sense of um, protection of over 90% effectiveness. And so the current method that we have been using, the manual method, is simply that we will call you back. We, Unfortunately, we have administered so few vaccines that we can actually manage that recall, that we can telephone them saying, your vaccine has come in, and as Dr. Samuel said, it, the second doses are rolling in. If I'm not mistaken, we've redistributed to Chesterfield County uh, second doses of their first stuff that they had received back in December and so on. So we're getting that vaccine and, and redirecting it to where it needs to go and contacting those that we've already shot to come get their second shot. It's a small enough population to manually do that. The added benefit of VAM slash prep mod, whichever one you used, as you got your first shot, you have the ability to make the second appointment right away. And so, uh, Lord willing, the vaccine will be there on that day. But that is the, uh, the process, is a second pod will be commensurately set up with the first one. Thank you for that. Uh, I have one question, Dr. Samuels, and team. First of all, we appreciate your being here today. How can a retired nurse or medical professional assist you and your team in, in administering shots or making calls or just volunteer? Right. Whom can they call or what, where can they register to call? Yeah, thank register. you so much, Mr. Holland, for that question because that does give me an opportunity to mm -hmm. offer my gratitude for the Medical Reserve Corps, or MRC for short. They have come up and supported us in spades. And so these are individuals who volunteer with the skill sets that you have just described. Uh, even administrative skill sets are of use right now. So much of our pod operation is staffed by these individuals, uh, retired doctors, nurses, those who are currently practicing, uh, as well as students, um, and, and then individuals in the community who are interested. So there are ways, definitely, to get engaged with our MRC program. And I happen to have the person who knows that very well, who was our former MRC coordinator. I'll turn it over to David again. Is there a phone number, website, link? Yes, sir. How can we do it? Very simple. www.va is in Virginia. MRC is in Medical Reserve Corps.org. VAMRC.org. And that will give them the links to volunteer. And as Dr. Samuel said, uh, we have a very robust uh, unit here in Chesterfield that is um, just coming out of the woodwork to help with this as they did with the testing operations back in the summer. We started this pandemic in March with 275 volunteers. 
as of this morning, we have 1,100 volunteers. And so that 275 fluctuated back and forth between 300 and, and 250, 350 for years. And then within the span of eight or 10 months, it double or quadrupled. So uh, it, general support, they do not have to have a medical background or even interest. They can do clerical work, line control, and so forth. Just so happens that in the audience today are a few MRC members, including our emergency manager here in the county, Jess Robison. She is the former CERT leader, and I joined CERT under her leadership, and she joined MRC under my leadership. It is that kind of cooperation. Right now, at the pod, we have half a dozen CERT members working alongside a dozen or so MRC members. Thank you. And repeat that website and yes, or phone number again one more time, if okay. you would, please. The, uh, the website is www.vamrc.org. Also, I'll give you my desk number. Your phone number? Yeah. Yes. Uh, if I can remember, 751-4364. That is my desk number, and I'm the, the one coordinating that right now. 751-4364. Yes, sir. David Woods. Thank you, Mr. Woods. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. One more follow-up follow follow question, and then we'll close out. I know I, first of all, Dr. Simmons, thank you very much for being here today. And um, we're trying not to shoot the messenger. We really are. Uh, again, we're trying to be helpful here. Um, but my colleagues... Ms. Haley brought up a good point, and, and I, I think it's important to clarify this for the community. And yes, I understand that before, um, that if you got the first shot, you were registering for the second shot. But my understanding is we're only getting X amount of shots that are, are vaccines that are coming in on a weekly basis, which means that if we're planning 28 days out for the second shot at 28 days, whatever we got coming in, we know that a portion of that is going to be set aside for second shots. Is that how it's working? Or are we getting a totally separate batch yes, that's going to be just for second shots? Because yes, it's sir. important that the, they know that, Absolutely. that if, the, if we're getting a second batch for that, that's important for the community to understand Correct. that. Correct. So there is an allocation for first shots and then an automatic separate allocation for second shots. That's good. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Thank you, Dr. Simmons, for being here. And of course, uh, Dr. Casey, would you wrap up any comments? Yes, uh, well, Chief Sander now can give the other side, the, the, Thank you. The, the, the operational side that we have done and that they're paying attention every day on behalf of the employees and, and citizens of, of Chesterfield. And, Dr. Again, I do want to thank Dr. Samuel, and, and again, he offered a, an invitation to, to a variety of board members and others to see what they were doing today. So the, 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 the 750 shots per day of that operation at the fairgrounds is operational. It's really well managed once you are there. What we've been talking about is, is how you get there, quite frankly. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Casey. Uh, Dr. Samuel mentioned in his presentation the importance of vaccination partners uh, outside of the healthcare system, you'll find some of the highest numbers of employees in both the Phase 1A and Phase 1B classifications among local government and schools. Some examples include, but are not limited to, fire and EMS, law enforcement, including the police department and sheriff's office, the 911 center, clinicians and practitioners who treat patients, and our teachers. As an employer, Chesterfield County functions as a VDH vaccination partner through the collective ex efforts of the Employee Medical Center, the Fire and EMS Department, and schools. In fact, the Employee Medical Center and the Fire and EMS Department are both registered with VDH and the CDC as vaccinators, and at some point we will be able to receive vaccinations directly. As a vaccination partner, uh, we can vaccinate thousands of individuals in Phase 1 and 1B, thereby lifting that workload off the health district so that they may focus more closely on the broader community. As vaccine supply becomes more available, expanding the network of vaccination partners throughout the community is going to be critical, including our pharmacies, our urgent care centers, and our primary care physicians. It will be essential to vaccinating the entire eligible population. Battalion Chief Justin Adams is going to walk you through our internal vaccination process, but let me first set the stage for the environment in which we have operated over the past several months. 
we were able to execute a plan in which we began vaccinating frontline fire and EMS uniformed members, those on the very front lines of this pandemic, within hours of receiving the first doses of the vaccine on December 23rd. We continue to execute that plan as we work to vaccinate our law enforcement members and other employees in the county in the 1A and 1B population. Vaccines are not mandated at the federal, state, or local level, and individuals must volunteer to be vaccinated. All of our public safety leaders and county physicians have worked very hard to educate our workforce about the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine and to set the example in getting as many of our essential employees vac vaccinated as possible. We have approached vaccinating our essential frontline public safety workers in a methodical way to ensure uninterrupted delivery of critical emergency services. Because this is a novel vaccine, there is the potential for side effects that could uh, increase absences among frontline public safety and other essential personnel. Accordingly, we are vaccinating those employees in limited numbers each day and are doing so at the end of their shifts to minimize the potential for absences. Our experience in the fire department thus far has been that approximately 7% of those receiving the first dose experience side effects, generally mild, aches, pains, headache, fever, while nearly 18% of those receiving the second dose have experienced side effects. And again, we're just in uh, starting the second phase of the dose at this point. Uh, among those two categories, we have had some individuals that have had to miss some time from work. So again, the importance is for essential personnel is to stagger those vaccines out and it therefore takes a little bit longer to accomplish our goal. Finally, we have ex executed our plan under frequently changing guidance from the state. We began vaccinating under very strict guidelines as to who was eligible for the earliest doses of the vaccine, resulted in a lim limited number of vaccines administered before the first of the year. Suddenly and without advance notice over the course of the week of January 11th, the de definition for phase one was expanded and regionally the health districts were moved into phase 1B. And as Dr. Samuel has discussed, supply has been unable to keep up with demand. I'll now turn it over to Chief Adams and let him walk you through our efforts to get uh, the most critical and essential workers uh, that are serving on the front lines of this pandemic vaccinated here in the county. Chief Adams. Thank you, Chief Center. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Casey. I am honored, next slide. I am honored to have the opportunity to present to you this afternoon on the vaccination efforts that have commenced on behalf of Chesterfield County Fire and EMS. I have to say that this vaccination process has been made possible through the 3P process, planning, preparation, and partnerships. Chesterfield County Fire and EMS in concert with our emergency manager have been planning for vaccine arrival for months before both either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine went before the FDA for emergency use authorization. We began our preparation by assembling a project team. That project team has been led by Captain Chad Vaughn, Deputy Director of the EMS Division, Dr. Alan Yee, who's present in the audience, our Operational Medical Director for Chesterfield County Fire and EMS, Mrs. Jess Robinson, Emergency Management Coordinator, Lieutenant Greg Jones, Captain Carl Adams, and Firefighter Jung Han, and a host of other valuable paramedics who have been reporting to work early, sometimes as early as 3 o'clock in the morning, and working long hours up until 10 or 11 o'clock at night to ensure the protection of the staffing levels throughout this process. It's important that I note that I am merely the spokesperson, and this project team is due and deserves all of the credit. I have had the honor and privilege to watch them work tirelessly over the last month and a half to ensure that our mission is accomplished. And then also partnerships. Those valuable public and private partnerships were established to ensure success. Those worth mentioning are those from our healthcare community. They include VCU, Bon Secours, and HCA, the Virginia Department of Health, the Chesterfield Health District in concert with Dr. Samuel and his team, and our internal coordination that includes County HR, 
the Emergency Medical Center, Chesterfield County Public Schools, IST, Fire and Emergency Management. Next slide. What I hope to be able to, to illustrate today is kind of walk you through our vaccination timeline. So beginning on December 22nd, we had the first opportunity to begin vaccinating our uniformed career fire and EMS staff along with some of our volunteer rescue squad members. That opportunity came to us through that collaborative partnership in healthcare when HCA reached out to us. They had some available vaccine. They didn't want it to go to waste. And based on the relationships that we have and continue to build with our uh, healthcare community, we were able to start to vaccinate some of our workforce. As Chief Center alluded to in his opening comments, we from the county perspective received vaccine on December the 23rd. At that time, we were able to have the Employee Medical Center um, begin vaccinations of their staff along with the jail medical staff. On the morning of December the 24th, we began vaccinating our operational workforce. We chose to stagger this approach and we, uh, we vaccinated our workforce on the morning that they were getting off. And just to create some transparency, we worked 24 hour shifts and we're all 48. So between the hours of six and eight o'clock in the morning, we vaccinated our operational folks the morning that they were getting off, knowing that there was potential for those members to experience side effect. And in hopes that it gave our members the 48 hours to recover so that it didn't impact continuity of operations for the residents of Chesterfield County. From there, we transitioned on January the 7th to vaccinating our Chesterfield police officers and our Chesterfield sheriff's officers who are extenders of emergency medical um, providers. As an example, those are the um, the road officers that routinely respond to overdoses, or maybe they show up and they assist us with cardiac arrest care where they deploy and utilize an automated external defibrillator. And from there, we began our LEO pods, our law enforcement pods on January the 12th. And not noted, we also began vaccination of County 1A employees that include mental health, social services, and environmental services on January the 19th. Next slide. To date, we have administered a total of 1,238 doses. Broken down, those have been 1,033 first doses and then an additional 205 doses. To date, of the identified population of people as identified by county HR, there are a total of 3,264 county employees who fall in the categories 1A, 1B, or age groups as identified by VDH. Of that, roughly 31.6% have been vaccinated. Next slide. As we look ahead, I think that it's important that we understand how and what influences this process from ordering to allocation to redistribution to actually getting vaccines in the arms of county employees. And what HR has done is they have classified these 1B employees to include the frontline workers, those employees that are 65 and older, and those that have underlying medical conditions. There is also a plan for us to transition and vaccinate the county 1C employees once 1B and 1A has been completed. The graph that you see kind of depicts a hierarchy, for lack of better terms, of, uh, as Dr. Samuel alluded, you, you have vaccines that come to the state, they're received, they're processed, and then they're kind of pushed down and allocated to the local health districts. In our case, the Chesterfield County Health District received those vaccines. They are then redistributed to, or redistributed to the Employee Medical Center, where Fire and EMS uh, receives a, an allocated dose, and so does the Chesterfield County Public Schools. Chesterfield Fire and EMS has taken on the roles and responsibility of vaccinating county government employees, while the Chesterfield County Public Schools have taken on having their nurses vaccinate school employees within their buildings. Please understand that these dose allocations are a collaborative effort and partnership between the Employee Medical Center, Dr. McGowan and his staff, fire and, and emergency management with Dr. Yee, 
and then also in concert with the school health leaders to determine how to fairly and equitably distribute those vaccines. Next slide. And as I wrap up my comments, I think it's important for us to know how do we share the workload so that we can all work towards a successful outcome in the future? Our vaccination team has worked extremely hard and developed a process and plan that is foundationally established on assisting and relieving some of the burden that has been placed on our local health district as they continue to focus on the expanded 1B expectations that have been placed upon them while still coordinating with our most vulnerable community populations. It is important to note that our plans remain scalable and flexible in nature to ensure that we effectively, efficiently, and safely vaccinate the Chesterfield County workforce while we remain flexible to adjust to the changes in state dose allocations. At this time, I'll turn the presentation back over to Chief Sun. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you, Chief. The slide that's before you, uh, I want to pivot first to the, the broader community. We talked a lot about the, the workforce here, the front line, uh, those serving on the front lines, but let's talk more about the community. Um, I want to first thank Natalie uh, Spillman for, for helping us uh, in performing some very rudimentary modeling to get a sense of the magnitude of the challenges that lie ahead. One major challenge that exists in such modeling is that uh, beyond looking at, at cer certain demographics such as age, it is nearly impossible to quantify a number of vaccine eligible populations living in our community among our essential workers, for example. Um, using public safety, for example, we can identify the number of our public safety members who live in the county, but there are literally hundreds of law enforcement officials, firefighters, and other public service folks that at work at the local, state, and federal level that live in our county and commute outside. So there's no way to capture that number. As we look farther down the road, when we get into different populations and we start talking about uh, grocery store workers, for example, there is no repository or registry for grocery store workers. So there is no way to classify our population based on these different phases in eligibility. Another significant challenge that you heard uh, previously is that home address and some other demographic data regarding those vaccinated are not required fields in the state's vaccination record system. And therefore, they may not be recorded. And it may not represent truly how many citizens have been vaccinated in a given locality. So accordingly, the data you will see in the next few slides should be considered very rough estimates as there are so many unknown and uncontrollable variables in our assumptions. Using available data from the VDH dashboard, the chart on the left represents the number of Chesterfield residents vaccinated with the first dose by age as of yesterday afternoon. 85% of those vaccinated in Chesterfield thus far are below 70 years of age and very likely represent those still in the workforce employed in occupations covered in phase 1A and phase 1B. What is not clear, and we're still trying to get the answer on this, is if any of this data includes the federally directed efforts to vaccinate long-term care facilities through contracts with Walgreens and CVS. The chart on the right represents the percent of those residents vaccinated by projected age groups in the county. And it's very clear there's a long way to go until 70% of those eligible for the vaccine receive it. Next slide. So how are we doing compared to other localities? Again, using the data available to us through the VDH website as of yesterday afternoon, the chart on the left shows that Chesterfield is among the top 10 localities in the state for first dose vaccine recipients. If you factor in the vaccines administered to residents who reside within the, health within the health district, but outside Chesterfield's borders, it brings the totals for the health district to 21,977, or third place among the top 10 localities as of yesterday afternoon. 
It's worth noting that because home address is not a required field in the state's vaccination record system, there are nearly 80,000 vaccines that have been administered that are not mapped to any particular locality. Some of those could be ours, and they're not mapped to our locality. In comparison, the chart on the right estimates how much progress has been made in re reaching the goal of vaccinating 70% of those who are eligible for the vaccine. Next slide. The final slide before you uh, was uh, requested by um, Dr. Casey, and again, Natalie has helped us with this, a uh, very rudimentary model looking at some assumptions, some planning assumptions for the future. How far do we have to go to get 70% of those 19 of years of age and older vaccinated in our, our community? For comparative purposes, we use the stated goal of the Biden administration to provide 1 million vaccines per day. And many have remarked that, that that level is very, very low. It needs to be higher. At that rate, Virginia's share should be about 30, 25,000 vaccines per day. And Chesterfield County, which would include government, schools, and the community at large, should have access to approximately 1,205 vaccines per day. If that were sustained, it would take about 179 days or six and a half months to vaccinate 70% of the population of 19 years of age and older. There would still be another lag beyond that to complete the second dose. Again, very rudimentary es you know, estimates here. All, you know, some people that reside in Chesterfield may be getting their vac uh, vaccinations through their employer, and they may work in Henrico or Richmond or some other place, and it gets credited to our, our county. What Chesterfield County is actually receiving, including the government schools, and the community combined is about 559 doses per day, and that was our estimate as of yesterday, and you heard some new uh, information from, from Dr. Samuel today that, that adjusts that further. Uh, but that results in about a 466-dose deficit from the federal goal, which at that rate will take almost a year to reach 70%. So we do have a long way to go, and supply, supply, supply is the issue moving forward. Next slide. I know that Dr. Casey will probably have some parting remarks um, and some additional information about our next steps. We continue uh, to support our local health district. We have partnered with them throughout this pandemic, and we can intend to continue to do that, and we are uh, continuing to look at ways that we can help them even more uh, during this very, very difficult time. Before I turn it back over to Dr. Casey, are there any questions that uh, either Chief Adams or I can ask about our vaccination efforts here among our county workforce. Any questions for wood members or comments? Well, I, I just have a comment, which I think is um, probably going to be just duplicative of, first of all, just thank you. Thank you to the incredible work your team has done. <laughs> Maybe you could go downtown and set up this network for the state, because clearly, you know, the, the, the piece of this that is very clearly heard is that the anticipation of understanding these were going to come, put the team together to put a, you know, a plan in place and executing that plan is working. And so I think that's, you know, that's what we're asking for you know, from the state is, you know, where's the plan and where's the confidence it's working? And it's clearly working here. And I think that, you know, the methodology and also the communication with our employees has clearly set out a path to let them know that there's going to be communication. They're going to know based on priorities, even within the different classifications, how they will be notified and when they will be vaccinated. So um, I'm really hoping that somebody can take a look at this model. <laughs> <laughs> and see that it works. And I think that, you know, goes back to even the conversations with Dr. Samuel. People just want information that they can rely upon, that's accurate information, um, so that they know what to anticipate. So, but thank you to your entire team and, and the coordination of all the teams that came together. And again, the partnerships that we, that exist in the community are huge to making this happen. So. I just, I just think it's important um, that we all stop and realize how it can come together and work in a very fluid fashion. Thank you. It's been a, certainly a team Excellent. effort. Excellent. Any other comments? Uh, again, I'd like to echo the uh, thanks for you and your team. I do have a question um, that I hope may be more of a statement as well. Um, right now, we're getting about 1,500 doses a week for county employees. Is that correct? 
It goes between county government and schools. Yes. And, there's and the allocation to schools right now out of the approximate 1,500 doses is approximately 1,240 a week, correct? I don't have the exact number, but I can tell you that there's a team that meets regularly. It includes uh, Dr. Yee, Dr. McGowan, as well as representation from the schools to decide the allocation based on uh, need between the two um, organizations. Yes. Just so you understand, where I'm going with that is we have elementary schools going, going back yes. next week. And with the doses that we've already allocated, plus the doses they have this week, we're relatively close to being able to vaccinate all of the teachers that are going back, but we're not quite there yet. And we are working with them to uh, try to make those doses available as quickly as possible for those teachers. Um, and I, I wanna make sure that the school community and our citizens here, that we are making it a priority as we designate those doses that the county has to those teachers that are gonna be uh, in those first frontline people that are going to be in the schools with the students that are returning first and that's where all of our efforts will go until they they have been vaccinated and um, I, I'm asking you to agree with me and if you don't you're welcome to disagree with me but I want to make sure that that point is made to the citizens. Absolutely we, we are looking at this uh, you know again a collective approach uh, we, we involve the doctors to make um, you know, uh, those medical decisions and recommendations. We still are vaccinating frontline public safety workers um, who are out there actually treating patients or running, interacting positive patients just about every day. Um, so we can't just walk away from those folks. We have to continue to get that completed, but we certainly are mindful of the needs of the schools and those, those frontline um, elementary school uh, teachers for sure. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I, I got to witness it firsthand the other night. Uh, the operation was smooth sailing. Uh, the paramedics that were doing the shots, people were in and over in, in the, the, the staging area. Very uh, well run operation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Casey. Just in conclusion, I hope you appreciate couldn't necessarily tell state or local in, in this room. Um, you know, we even this morning and to the, the, to the assistance of the county attorney's office, even try to come up with what's considered, a, you know, a statement of cooperation, uh, not necessarily something long and legal, but about a paragraph of our intent to be intentional, uh, even with Dr. Worsley, almost, you know, just waking up every day feeling like he is part of the health department team and, and the eyes and ears and bring them to the resources that they need, whether it's IST, uh, other other departments that were mentioned. Uh, out of respect for Dr. Samuel, you know, he, he feels he may need to clear that through the state hierarchical downtown. Uh, I am going to try and be arm in arm with him on that regards and, and actually forwarded that statement of cooperation to Clark Mercer, uh, the governor's chief of staff, because uh, this isn't a long, complicated memorandum of understanding that we've been going through for nine months with Fire EMS trying to understand the data of the people out there. Mm -hmm. So when it responds, it knows who it's responding to. That's, that one has just been uh, almost, you know, it needed to be legislatively changed. Uh, this is, again, just a simple statement of cooperation, about a paragraph, if you will. And, and again, we're going to focus all of our efforts to try and get that executed so that we can help be behind the curtain and, and again, fly the same flag. Thank you, Dr. Casey. Thank you all. We appreciate it. Thank you, Chief and Chief. Great job. I appreciate it so very much. Keep up the great work.